from everybody in this week's seminar. We have a pleasure to, to host Daniel Reitzner and Jan Buda from Masaryk University. And Daniel is also from Institute of Physics, Polish Academy of Science. Uh, Science uh, Slovak. Slovak. <laughs> Slovak. <laughs> what did I say? Slovak. Okay. Well, you said Polish. <laughs> but oh, gosh. That's us. That's, oh, us. that's us. Yes, yes we are. <laughs> Yes, anyway, like uh, gentlemen that we are hosting uh, uh, today, they are experts on uh, foundations of quantum mechanics, uh, especially, uh, I guess, incompatib incompatibility uh, theory, um, joint measurability, right? Uh, and uh, what? And then, yeah, state discrimination and yeah, to, uh, today, uh, Daniel will be uh, telling us how to efficiently implement generalized uh, quantum measurements with limited resources and uh, application of, of this uh, scheme to unambiguous state discrimination. I'm very happy to uh, have you, Daniel, please. Uh, Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to be in, uh, uh, in Poland again. <laughs> and uh, yeah, let's, let's start. Uh, Thank you for introduction. And um, as said, I will be talking about these general measurements with limited resources. Uh, some of you are, I think, are know much more than I do in this topic. But uh, nevertheless, I will uh, try to do the whole stuff with a motivation framework and implementation and this application to quantum analysis, state discrimination to, to, to give the feeling of, of uh, how it's done in detail. So as I said, these are these three main parts, motivation, framework, and implementation, which is something to build up uh, to the application on un unambiguous discrimination of states. Before starting, I will uh, just tell you that this, this, this is based on our preprint on archive from uh, previous year, uh, but um, the story that goes with it is uh, such that w when we were teaching uh, the students on um, programming quantum computers, we had uh, this thought that mm, if we want to implement the POVM, the, the generalized measurement, how to do it? So we started looking on internet whether somebody did it. And I found nothing. I, I don't know whether Jan found anything, whether he was looking, but I, I didn't find anything. So I started computing from scratch we had this motivation, I build up the framework, and uh, we come up with the implementation. And then I look... So, so just a small comment, uh, we actually like implemented a baby, uh, baby versions of it, some POVMs in the paper from 2019. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, IBM. yeah. Uh, but, but it's, it was, yeah. It, this was mm -hmm. this, um, uh, it was like uh, about the without, without additional well. qubits. This, uh, this so, this. Uh, so basically, it was this paper about the implementation with post selection of POVMs. Yes, and, post selection. Uh, yeah. There was, uh, yeah, so we did uh, compare it with uh, Nymark, but it was only for mm -hmm. single qubit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, of course, Nymark, I will come to that. Um, you have, I, I, I've seen you have a new paper out, uh, well, on archive uh, this year. I don't know which month was it which uh, also has some, some new ideas, right? About yes, uh, yes. So th one that additional we, qubit uh, and post-selection. Uh, uh, exactly, exactly. So there we didn't, uh, we, uh, yes. we didn't test it experientially. Yeah. Yeah. But let, let us uh, give the floor to Daniel. <laughs> no, I mean, of course, I'm just like laughing, right? I mean, it was one qubit experiment uh, a few years ago. <laughs> yeah, uh, but this is somehow, um, um, a general framework and uh, impl implementation details, uh, how to do it. Like there are more details to this and uh, it's for general setup of uh, multiple qubits. Uh, but uh, once I, ha I had all this computation, I looked at the internet and found out that in 2008 already, uh, Eric Anderson and Daniel Oy already had the paper. I just didn't use uh, the right uh, search terms to find it. So I was really angry at myself and that, uh, no, of, of course, at Eric and Daniel. <laughs> Why did they do this to us? So we, we were looking for at least for some applications, and this is this unambiguous discrimination of states, uh, the expansion of, of what to do with it. 
Uh, also a short note that uh, I will not post references during the presentation. Everything will be at the end because there's also some something I want to say. And uh, if you want to know which paper is uh, relevant to which point, uh, it's either at the end or in the paper. Okay, so this was a small demotivation and now we can come to motivation. So, um, as we all know, now uh, many uh, companies offer quantum computing time on their small noisy devices. So these have uh, very limited resources. These are noisy, so they have uh, low coherence times and uh, they have also for now low number of qubits. So we, we need to be uh, very careful uh, with the use of qubits as well. Uh, as this will, this talk will deal with measurements, um, another limited uh, limitation of this uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum devices is uh, that they allow you to do only projective Z measurements. Of course, even this isn't the true. This isn't true, but for this, for the sake of this talk, well, let's just assume that at least this is uh, this is somehow done well. But uh, well, can I ask this, you so yes, that, that those projective Z measurements they are noisy. This is what you mean when they yeah yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. So 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 yeah, you, you have I've read that paper with you have with the Zoltan that you you uh, try to correct the errors of measurements and so on. So. Sure, and Philip also yeah uh, yeah. But like here's a, a thought. Maybe we should you know. Uh, push those like because i think like when you maybe open the box a bit like the uh, like and maybe have control over those pulses maybe uh maybe that allow that can allow you to on the hardware level do generalized measurements mm -hmm. I, well i don't know i'm speculating right maybe that would be something some funny uh, like, i don't know how, how it's done so i really don't neither, know no neither do yeah. i in detail but like you know when you have optical system like sometimes mm -hmm. sometimes you can uh, okay like you you do non-projective measurements there natively and uh, yeah. yeah anyway just a just a comment uh, yeah. but this will be still some specific types of measurements that you can perform uh, definitely yeah sure so yeah you i think you will always have to somehow work so that these measurements work in your ad advantage that if you want to perform some POVM, then you have to somehow map it to the POVM that it can perform. Yeah. And then what we have here is just the mapping to uh, projective set measurements. So we assume this is what uh, the devices do. Mm -hmm. And we want, there are many algorithms that uh, require you to do some POVMs. So I, I guess all of you know what POVM is, but for um, the sake of reference and uh, notation, I just say that I will we will we consider just the finite uh, um, outcome POVM. So uh, there will be a finite number of outcomes, and then you can describe the the POVM, the measurement, as a set of uh, operators that which are called effects, and effects are uh, non uh, positive operators, positive semi-definite operators that sum up to identity. So this is the POVM. This is the definition of measurement. And if you observe some outcome J, which outcomes will be in this circle, and you are in a state row, then the probability of, of this of observ observing this outcome is given by the Born formula, which is trace of AJ times rho. And now as said at the beginning, any POVM can be realized um, by dilating the system and performing projective measurements. So you do some Neimark dilation and, um, and you, you have a system of larger dimension and there, there you can do uh, projective measurements. But this might require quite a lot of uh, additional qubits. Um, I, I added here, I just noticed I read your paper that, uh, or at least seen your paper that uh, through simulability, 
you just need additional number of qubits to, to the twice the number of qubits if, if it's right I, if i understood yeah but nevertheless if, if you have let's say uh n qubits uh, or some general n outcome measurement or well there are different uh, combinations that you can consider why either several qubits then you need additional more qubits or you have you, you can have an, an outcome measurement and if you perform the, the dilation uh the standard dilation on one qubit you might require uh additional n minus one qubit and silas and this is not what we want because qubits are very precious so we need we want to use as few of them as possible so the idea is um, to exchange sorry, comment. yes so if you have an outcome so I guess you would require maybe log of n and see like qubits. Uh, this is a uh, very naive in, uh, implementation of Nymark dilation. I, I I haven't looked at. Uh, okay, okay. So where do you like have this log? I think you need to, like, or you care about? I think for so it's like the dimension, right? You need to have enough dimension, which is like yes, some of the ranks. Yes, uh, some of right? the ranks. And, uh, if some of the uh if some of the rank is like n right because you have n uh, yeah. qubits it's of order n then it's like log n qubits right because like every qubit gives you a factor of two. uh like it's, it's just like uh yeah okay yeah I, it would be log n probably yes yes but nevertheless you might have uh quite a large number of you you want to save some qubits for some other tasks and the, 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 sure. the idea is to exchange these spatial resources for temporal resources. And the question is, then is, is it possible to spread such, spread any measurement you want to perform over time and perform it as a sequence of partial measurement? And the, this is what this part will be about, the framework and implementation. So in, in extreme case, uh, if you don't add any ancillas, there's your result that you, it is possible, but only probabilistically, which uh, does not require a long coherence time because you just measure, 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 and do post selection. Uh, but the probability, success probability scales with dimension d as one over d. So you might to do repeat it quite a lot, a lot of times. And in this talk, or what we do, we allow one ancillary qubit and we look at what, what, what's possible. So what can we gain by uh, using one qubit? One qubit uh, allows us to have uh, simply as no answers. So we can get one bit of information from the system, which means that if we have, let's say, measurement with six outcomes, what we can do in each step is that split it. Um, we call it coarse graining, but sometimes it's called partitioning. Uh, we can partition it to uh, two groups, these outcomes, and have a measurement, let's say B, where we would ask whether uh, the, the state we are given uh, gives outcomes one or two, or gives outcomes, one of the outcomes three through six. And if we will get, let's say, answer this one, then we can, then the idea is to perform another measurement, let's call it C1, where we would uh, do this fine graining of the measurement to look whether it is one or two. And in this case, we can look whether it was three, four, or five, six, and then have a consecutive measurement for, for finding the outcome. Okay, so this is the idea. And now the question is whether it is possible to do. So just yeah. like if uh, so, I understood correctly, this yeah. is like adaptive scheme of implementation. It would uh, be adaptive. That's yeah. what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. This is here also here explained that now now you have many options that what you can do with this course grade. You can uh, um, do the binary binary search procedure for the outcome. So let's say let's say you have an eight outcome measurement, and first you look at whether it is it it can be outcomes one to two, four or Five through eight, and if it's one through four, then you divide it further, one to two, uh, one through two, or one or two, or whether it is outcome three or four. And then again, if it's 
one or two, you look for a measurement that will tell you which one of those it is. <coughs> and of course, you can see here, this is what you asked, that in this scheme, if you have uh, the answer that it's, it's outcome one uh, through four, then you need to look for uh, which of those outcomes it is. And if you will get outcome uh, that it's not one through four, then you look which one of those, uh, those four it is. So in, you need to adapt uh, your measurements based on the previous results, so, uh, which is not also not uh, part of current quantum devices that are freely available. But this search is quite efficient because you just need to lock uh, of n measurements of the order of this. Another possibility what you can do is uh, what can be called as outcome decreasing procedure. So you, st you look, what you ask at the beginning the question, is it outcome one? And either it is outcome one or not. If it's not outcome one, then you know it's uh, one of the outcomes two through n. And then you, you proceed in this fashion. Is it outcome two? If not, then is it outcome three? And so on. You can continue. This, this would require long uh, coherence times because you would have to perform n such measurements, or let's say n minus one. But the, the, the good thing about this is that it does, it does not require conditional measurements. You, you can continue. If you get this outcome, you can continue with the same procedure, but you can let it go, but you don't care about the rest because you already have your outcome. So these are just two of several options that you can, uh, what you can do with this, if it is possible. So now let's, let's try to see uh, how the, sorry, Daniel, how the frame. Sorry, uh, yeah. because you said yeah? two of the possible options. So, so, but do you have, do you have some, let's say, general understanding, like, let's say, what are all the options that are possible and what are the advantages, disadvantages of different? Uh, yeah, the, what options are possible? Uh, basically all options uh, with uh, binary measurements. So you can partition it in any way you want. This will be the result. But uh, sure. towards what is best, we don't have much. Uh, I will have some indication at uh, somewhere here in application. Mm -hmm. So I, this will be based on, on the details of implementation. So again, implementation is just, it, it's not, the, we did not do it in whole generality. So there might be some, some uh, freedom for optimization, but nevertheless, it shows that, it will show that there are uh, differences between different implementations. So let's get back to the framework and whether it is possible to split measurements. So uh, at the beginning, you told me that in your paper, you don't require uh, to describe the state changes. Here we require state changes because you, after measurement, you want to uh, do another measurement on the state. So we need to describe the state change, what happens to the state of during the measurement. And in order to describe these state changes, we use the formalism of instruments. So what are instruments for each, uh, each POVM? Let's say we have a POVM A defined by these effects. And uh, the, the corresponding instrument is such a, com such a set of complete, uh, completely positive maps uh, described by this IJ or written as IJ. And with, with the requirement for the probabilities for outcome J to coincide. So we want that if we have this IJ, this uh, CP map, then uh, it transforms the state to some state rho, J, uh, rho to rho J uh, tilde. And the trace of this will tell us the probability of the outcome J. 
So this is the requirement for uh, this um, instrument corresponding to uh, to the uh, POVM A. So we want the probabilities to coincide. Naturally, if uh, A when AJ is uh, positive uh, and sum up, sums up to identity, this AJ sum, sums up to sum up to identity. So if we would uh, sum it over J, then we would find out that sum of J I J has to be a channel because this would give us uh, one. The probability sums up to one, and so this is a channel. So the sum of these CP maps is. Uh, now, what is the uh, state that comes out of this? This is just a very abstract mathematical description of, of, of a state change. Um, as said, the conditional unnormalized post-measurement state is given by this tilde. It's just uh, ij applied to rho. And if you want to have the normalized conditional state, we, we know that uh, the trace of ij is the probability. So we just divide it by uh, one of the pi uh, pj is probability. So this is this is the, the post measurement uh, normalized state. It's computed like this. Uh, in some of the papers, uh, they don't use instruments. They just look at uh, look at it through Krauss operators, which is a in this sense quite equivalent. There's not much difference between the, the two approaches. And now we have a way how to describe the stage change, but uh, in order to perform the sequence of measurements that would uh, that would make the, the whole measurement be, um, maybe, uh, maybe I will tell it later. Okay, um, so we we want so if if you want to perform two measurements one after each other. And the first one should not destroy the information that can be obtained with the second measurement. So, so the first measurements, the, the earlier measurement, measurements should be as little as should not disturb the state too much. Okay, so that the information about the fine grain measurements is intact. And so we don't need to uh, the, the earlier measurements not to destroy any information because this is not possible. But just to destroy such information that is not uh, important for us anymore at this at that point, and we'll see that it works just fine. So, but we need to um, choose this instrument very carefully, because not not all the instruments uh, are not, are such non destructive. Non destructive. If if you imagine a measure and prepare, uh, so. You, so you can imagine it as a measure and prepare channel. So you just measure and prepare something. That's a completely destructive measurement. And this wouldn't be a good uh, state change because you lose all the information. But in many works, it is shown that a special type of instru instruments that is called Luders instruments are the least disturbing in some sense. And the Luders instruments are um, defined by this formula. So if we have uh, the effect AJ, then the operation with index J is defined by this uh, sandwiching between the square roots of AJ, as the state row is sandwiched. It, it is, now you can see that if AJ is a projection, then you've got just the standard form of non-measurement state change. And now, so can I yes. ask, in, in, in what sense those Luders instruments are least dis, uh, disturbing? Um, there's a uh, uh, Paul Bush has uh, some paper where it, it's in, uh, I think it's in just some specific ways. I, I don't remember anymore how, how, would it, how was it. I, I, I thought that Teiko had some some result that uh, any channel edge or uh, any measurement can be done as Luders, and then some some uh, channel that you apply afterwards. 
But when talking to him, he said that, no, no, he doesn't remember. So I can't find the result where, but, but I think he was, he was saying something like that. Maybe he, he changed his mind. <laughs> but nevertheless, that um, there are some indications, like maybe in, in specific cases, indications that Luther's instrument don't uh, destroy some part of uh, information and so on. So it, it's usual, like it's, it's sort of a consensus that, okay, this, this, this might be the first to try because this, this would destroy the least, although maybe not, it, it, it isn't proved in any rigorous way. Yeah. So just just a comment. Okay, this is like you know it's a casual uh, yeah. you know discussion. So I'm uh, like okay, I'm, I'm aware of one more from the side of foundations, one paper, which kind of derives this this let's say update rule uh, from some kind of entropic considerations. So mm -hmm. you you have like uh, you want to either probably probably want to minimize the post measurement uh, ent entropy given the uh, the measurement statistics that you observe or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, I think maybe for for sure for von Neumann measurement something like that was de uh, derived. Uh, just uh, yeah. I, I'm not okay it's not relevant mm -hmm. to my question but like I, I'm aware of such results as well. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's good it's, it's very good uh, question and uh, um, okay, it's 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 a bit it's a different question uh, than what we solve here because we just yeah. heard you 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 hear oh leaders are the best and let's use them use them yeah. and if it work, it, it works sure. then it works of course but to prove that they are the least uh, disturbing then you this is a much more difficult question to answer so I I don't know I don't don't know whether uh, where I could find such result. If you know, then I'll be happy to hear about it. But we can take it as, as uh, okay, this was given to us. Okay, Luther's in instruments, let's use them. So will they do the task? Let's see. So now let's consider uh, some coarse graining of the measurement. So we, we have some uh, set of effects. The set is given by the index set Q. These are indices that define this coarse grain effect, one effect. And the, and the, the other one is identity minus B, the rest of the, uh, the measurement. But we want to see uh, this one effect, how it behaves. And now we, we assume that it was measured. That, uh, this is what the, the outcome gave us corresponds to these effects, effect B. The post-measurement state is this rho tilde, which is given by this uh, this formula. And now uh, what happens here is that uh, if you want to perform uh, the subsequent measurement, the subsequent measurement cannot be the same as the, as the intended one. For example, if you imagine uh, that you, you want to measure uh, sigma x and sigma z directions on the spin. Now you, you cannot do this, of course, but if you uh, make them noisy, these two measurements, then you can do them uh, one after each other, or you can do them uh, jointly. So we can have a joint measurements for a noisy sigma x and sigma z measurement. And let's say we are in this range where it is possible. So how, you, you can do it also uh, in a sequence. You first measure the sigma, uh, sigma x measurement or sigma x measurement is like this. And then you've got some result and you want to perform, uh, you perform this sig uh, noisy sigma z measurement. And if you want to have also the information about sig uh, noisy sigma z measurement, what you do is not to perform the noisy sigma z measurement, but you perform the sharp sigma z measurement. Because you, you need to, uh, the projective sigma z measurement on, on the, output state of the first measurement. Because you lose some information, so you need to uh, make the uh, subsequent uh, measurement less noisy, in, in a sense. And this is what happens here. But if you, if you want to perform this fine graining, so you want to find which of the AJ it is, then you cannot perform AJ after the B, because B already uh, destroyed some part of the state here. 
So what you want is that if you, you want to find such a uh, change measurement, a, a prime, the POVM a prime, that if you measure in this state rho tilde, this state, uh, changed state, then the probabilities would correspond. So this, this trace of the changed state and this AJ prime, this uh, different, this, this corrected uh, POVM is the same as trace of the original state and AJ. Now let's see what happens. If we input this rho tilde here, we get this formula. And now we can rearrange, we can move these uh, operators around. So we, we, we rotate B uh, to the, the square root of B to the end and obtain this formula. And now this has to hold for all states rho. As, and so in general, what we want is that uh, we identify that AJ equals the square root of B applied on AJ prime and the square root of B. But we want to know what AJ prime is. And uh, for this, it's just enough to take the pseudo in inverse of B and its square root, which is this. And you will find out that AJ prime is defined by this formula. Now, still, we don't know whether this works because AJ prime might come up some, something that's not a POVM. So let's see. We had this state change and we have this corrected uh, POVM defined by this formula. This formula doesn't change the positivity. So it's clearly uh, positive semi definite. But now let's check the sum of these AJs. We sum in this uh, in index set Q, which defined the B here. And if, if I'll input here, uh, rewrite this AJ by, by this formula, I have here this. Now the sum over AJs is just B. And so altogether, this is just uh, the identity on the support of B. So you might not have uh, the full identity, but we don't care. Uh, because, because here we can see that both this AJ, uh, the support of AJ is, under, uh, is smaller than support of B for each J from uh, AJ from this set. And also the, the same holds for this row, row tilde. And so whatever is lost in this row tilde after the B measurement wouldn't be measured anyway by, anyway by any of these AJs. So we don't lose any information that we, we could, uh, we could uh, have access to anymore. So everything is fine. So it works. So it, yeah, but just yeah. one comment, just mathematically, I, uh, maybe I got distracted, but like, I guess all that matters is that this AJ prime, because you know it's positive, you only need to show that it's uh, like, uh, how to put it, uh, it's, it has no, like operator norm smaller than one, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's like mathematically all you need to guarantee and this equality, like when you sum over J kind of guarantees it, it seems to me, right? Uh, maybe this is a little bit stronger because uh, that it sums up to identity. Uh, if it's just smaller than, uh, the norm is smaller than one. Uh, yeah, maybe this is the same. I mean, okay, you want you you are wondering whether I mean this is at least how I understand it. You you are wondering whether you can kind of cook up uh, let's say instrument that would be doing this uh, like this thing that you wanted from previous slide. So this construction algebraic one kind of does it for you, but all that remains like you. Basically, all which can be problematic is whether maybe your norm is too large for some reason when you do this inverse, but it's uh, maybe I'm oversimplifying. Uh, I, maybe what, uh, what could happen is that, uh, uh, that if, if, if you would correct these AJs and you would, uh, they would not be able to provide you the whole information. On the row, so if 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 it could if it would happen that the the row tilde would would be beyond the support of B, then uh, this part beyond the support of B 
wouldn't be measurable by any of this AJ, AJ prime or AJ. And uh, maybe there could be some loss on, in, of information. But this is just to reassure our, ourselves that, that nothing like that happens. Mm -hmm. So, so you can, so if you perform Luder's instrument at this point, and then you fine grain the measurement, then uh, you, you can get all the information that's, that, that would be uh, necessary originally. So this is, mm -hmm. this is what's uh, intended in this slide. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the, and the, the, the conclusion is that, yes, it is possible to split the measurements in this way. That's what I said. And now in the implementation part comes the answer, how? So how is it? So um, to do this, we, we add an additional qubit and couple it to the original system here with a unitary U, and then uh, perform the projective Z measurement, which we assumed is the case here, uh, is available to us. And based on the result at zero or one, we have this state row J here. So, of course, this is some instrument. Anything that this defines a state change is an instrument. And by this coupling, we can uh, we want to see what this U has to be or whether even such U exists that performs the, the Luder's instrument. And uh, OK, if, if you write it out, this, this thing here, then you have a state row with some zero ancilla, then you perform this unitary, and then you measure uh, J on ancilla. So this is the, the formula for obtaining the tilde of row J. And if J equals one, this corresponds to outcome one, uh, we will say that this corresponds to successful measurement of effect. And zero will be uns unsuccessful measurement. So this would corresp correspond to measuring identity minus B. The choice of choice here is arbitrary, but it's a slightly advantageous because if 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 you have the unsuccessful measurement, then you want to have you want that nothing happens to this state, the zero goes away. This is just for this reason. And now we also require that if uh, we have so so if outcome one is observed, so we have uh, applied this I1, then this corresponds to Luders of B. And if we have an outcome zero, then this corresponds to Luders of identity minus B. And now, if, if I'll put this together and, we're, and play with it a little bit, we'll find out that this Luders of B has to equal to this here and Luders of, uh, well, Luders with identity minus B has to equal this one. Now U is on both systems, like here, but this is only on ancillas, the zero and one here. And if you look at both sides, you can uh, easily guess that if you take uh, B, uh, the square root of B to be this here, then you have found out uh, this U, at least the disc some description of this U. Of course, this is not unique, but it is sufficient to set it like this. That B, the square root of B is equal to this, and the square root of identity minus B is uh, equals this. Now, a little bit of, uh, again, a small, small correction here. Uh, this B and identity minus B are uh, not diagonal in general. And it's, it's, it's nice to have them in diagonal form, We'll see soon why. So if, if you diagonalize them, this means that you applied some uh, unitary UB here. If you put it uh, down the formula here, then you will find out that both of these formulas will have something like this here, which we can call some joint uh, unitary operation B. And what it means is that if you have a state row, then you want to rotate it uh, from the B basis into the Z basis, then perform the coupling, measuring the Z basis, and then you can rotate it back to the B basis. 
This is all that, it, that it's done here. So now we just need, we have this here. Uh, you need to be able to do this. And then you can do, look and look at what this V is. So what is this V? This comes up here. And if you now uh, have a basis where the ancilla is the first qubit and this register is afterwards, then this V has this form that you have identity minus V that the square root of it the diagonal of it, the diagonal version of identity minus b squared, uh, square root of it. And here you have b squared, square root. So this is what you have. And this, you can check easily that these columns here will, uh, are, uh, are normalized and uh, orthogonal, orthonormal. And so you can fill in these places easily. For example, like this. There are, again, several options that you can do, but you, the V can be chosen in this way. And again, this is still in basis where the ancilla is uh, the first qubit. So now let's put it into this order. That first we have the register and then we have the ancilla. How does it look like? Uh, the V now looks like a da block diagonal matrix with uh, qubit matrices V0, V1, up to some Vr minus one, where these Vj are uh, given by the non-zero eigenvalues. Of course, if you have zero eigenvalues, then these are uh, the identities here. Okay, so this is just explicitly uh, shown here that the non-zero uh, eigenvalues of V lead to uh, non-trivial uh, unitaries, the qubit unitary is here, and the rest is identities. And uh, also, you can choose the order in which this is done. So the first go. Uh, sorry, can you, can you recall what yeah. is R? Again, is it like yes. a rank of the... the... The R is the number of non-zero... Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Thanks. Basically rank, yeah. Okay, uh, now if, if you consider this uh, diagonal block diagonal matrix, this is just a controlled unitary. So for j's from zero to this r minus one, you just control on the system and perform some vj with this, this vj's here. And for the rest, it's just identity. So this is uh, how it's done, how we can do looters. So we, now we know that uh, looters instruments can be used for the sequential scheme and we also know that this scheme uh, is a way to implement it. You rot rotate from the B basis to the Z basis, perform these controlled operations. You, you need to compute these VJs. And then you just rotate the state back to B and perform the measurement here. Okay, so this was uh, the framework and implementation. Um, now I will show quickly how we applied it to an ambiguous state discrimination. So I hope everything was clear up to now. Yeah. Okay. So if there are some questions you can, any, anybody can ask. Okay. I always encourage people to ask, but they are Good, sure. good. So uh, what is an ambiguous state discrimination? This is a, uh, a re relatively standard quantum information or quantum theoretic task that if you are given a set of states, now we can just imagine they are pure states, psi j, and they have some a priori probabilities pj of being given to you. You are to design a task which discriminates between these states with zero error. So if I will give you state two, psi two, you have to tell me it was state psi two. So the zero error is this requirement that you cannot tell me anything else. But in quantum theory, we know that this is uh, perfectly possible only if the states are orthogonal. If the states are non-orthogonal, you, you cannot always do this. You have to pay a price for this, non, uh, this quantum. So if, if states are not orthogonal, this price is uh, by having an inc inconclusive outcome, which will be 
sh uh, shown with question mark. What it means is that if I'll give you a state and you tell me it's state Psi 2, it will be state Psi 2. But from time to time, you will get an answer, and this inconclusive answer, this question mark, and then you will tell me you don't know. And this is fine. Just as long as you don't tell me the wrong result. Okay? So this is a different, the, the task without this uh, inconclusive outcome is the, you, you want to minimize the error. Here we want to have zero error and the, the mistakes are somehow, or the, what you don't know is concentrated in this inconclusive outcome. Okay, and now to simplify uh, things even further, let's suppose we are given just say psi one and psi two with equal probabilities. And now we design a way how to discriminate between these two states. Um, for simplicity, we can assume that the, these states are nicely uh, determined. So psi one is on the block sphere here, between zero and one, and psi two is here. So they are de described by these formulas. And here, if omega equals zero, then they are the same state and you cannot discriminate them. They are always the same state. And if uh, omega is pi, pi over four, then they will be either plus state or minus state, which are perfectly distinguishable. And so you can always tell them apart. So now the, the unambiguous discrimination measurement is described by effects A1 and A2, and this A question mark. And for this, it holds that, uh, when can you tell that it's state one? It's exactly at that point when you, you say it's not the state psi two. So you take a uh, state perpendicular to, to, pi, to, to psi two, this is the projection for that state. And you know that you can never measure psi two in this, in this, uh, with this projection. So that's why it's a good candidate for, uh, for this A1. You just have to scale it down. And because we chose the equal probabilities, we just put here some lambda. And the, the question, a question mark is just a complement uh, effect. And uh, now here uh, you, you can compute that this lambda is this number. Uh, it's good to at least remember that uh, there are some probabilities that in, for inconclusive and conclusive answers which come uh, from this lambda. Uh, the lambda cannot be one because uh, you would have uh, an effect. We would have an operation, operator that is not effect, that is not positive. So this is the, the condition for lambda is taken from the positivity of a question mark. Okay, so this is the, the task. And now that's, that, that's all what we needed to know. Uh, we now look at uh, two different ways how to look at this problem. So uh, let's start with the standard version. The standard version was, uh, it was solved uh, a long time ago, I think 1991. It was Perez and uh, Dix and Ivanovic. Mm, they, they, all, they, they all worked out this, uh, how, how it works. And what they, what basically the result is by Asher Perez, who added this extra qubit and then either uh, got the result, whether uh, got some indication of whether uh, on the original qubit that he has some conclusive answer or not. And this is exactly what is done here. So we, we first have a measurement B, which tells us whether we have an inconclusive answer or conclusive answer. And if it's conclusive answer, we want to see whether it is one or two. And if you do the computation with the implementation uh, in, in the framework that uh, I showed you, then the pre-measurement state, so you, you couple the, the, the state, the uh, ancillary qubit, and then before you measure it, the state looks like this. And now you can see that if you would measure zero on the ancilla, then you would have state one on the original system. 
And this is irrespective of whether you, uh, you, uh, you, you were given state Psi 1 or Psi 2. This is with probability cosine uh, to omega, which is the inconclusive probability. And with conclusive probability, you will, be, you will end up in one of the states plus or minus one corresponding to the index one or two, which are perfectly distinguishable. So the situation is that if you have a given state Psi 1, then with conclusive probability, uh, you, you get the second measurement where you measure uh, always that it's outcome one. And if you are given Psi 2, you always measure outcome two in the conclusive scenario. So this is the standard result. Uh, can recover right. it so, easily. Uh, can, I, yeah. can I ask? So those those people that uh, figure out this uh, an ambiguous state discrimination for qubit, uh, they were not thinking in were they thinking this language of instruments and sequential measurements, or mm -hmm. rather they were thinking about like abstract POVMs. I think the latter, right? Yes, only POVMs. Yeah, right. So. I think uh, Deeks and Ivanovich had this, this result that uh, showed that you need to, okay, they, they started this uh, unambiguous discrimination direction and they showed that you have to have this extra outcome and one of them had this, this probability of success, what it can be somehow uh, in there, but it, were, it wasn't perfect yet. Either it was uh, probabilistic or somehow imperfect. And then uh, just a year after that, uh, Asher Perez came up with this con construction. He basically uh, did the same construction we do, do here. In front ah, of okay, so, the, so he, it's sequential. He, okay. Yeah, it, it's not sequential uh, because it is sequential and it's not sequential because you can postpone the measurements to till the end. In, in I will talk about it a little bit later or I can talk about it right now that um, an ambiguous discrimination is possible only for linearly independent states. So in dimension D, you can discriminate only up to these states. And uh, if you add an, an additional ancillary qubit, this allows for this inconclusiveness answer. So if you, if you get the inconclusive answer, then uh, the, the state on the original system be, will be the same for all all in input states. But if you will observe that it's a conclusive answer, then the original uh, register will change to some, uh, well, we'll have the possibility to, to be uh, the set or, or will be the set of orthogonal states like here. So you change this to, to, to the Z, uh, to the Z basis, then you perform this coupling, then you measure. And after that, here you have uh, for each J, you have a different set from the, from, uh, the orthonormal basis. And so you just need to rotate this basis to, to somehow measure it here. So you can, you already have enough space here to measure uh, these, this orthogonal state to dis discriminate them. So you, what you can do is you just postpone this measurement until the end and measure everything. And this is what, uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt, please, because uh, you are in the middle. Of no, it's just that, uh, and I don't know what I wanted to say. <laughs> so yeah, you can postpone the measurement and uh, on the original system, you will have the answer which one of this uh, input state it is. And on this uh, ancillary qubit, you will have answer whether it is uh, you know, the conclusive answer or inconclusive answer. Mm -hmm. So, but can you, uh, okay, um, can you kind of divide your, let's say, conclusive and inconclusive answers differently? Because here you separate the conclusive answer from, uh, conclusive answers from inconclusive one, right? But in principle, mm -hmm. you could kind of play the game that you played previously, but you have, you would have this inconclusive answer in the middle, so to say. You mean like this, the version, okay, this was the standard version that I presented here for this qubit. And here is the version where you can choose that, okay, I can uh, first go for the uh, 
that I want to know whether it was outcome one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have this B measurement here and ask, is it outcome one? And you either get the answer that yes, it's outcome one, or you will get this answer, it's one prime, it's not outcome one, in which case you perform some measurement A prime, where you look whether it is outcome two, and if it's not outcome two, it has to be in conclusive answer. So this is the setup uh, that you can do also. And then uh, we computed it uh, analytically. It's, it's not as simple as this here, the symmetric case, but it's still doable. I mean, it's, it's nice enough to do by hand, but not nice enough to show on slides. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, and this one is sequential, yes? Yes, like, it's also you know, this, this, um, uh, none of them has to be sequential. Ah, okay. So this can also be realized yeah. like uh, as postponed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I follow up on the last question a bit? Yeah. So the, the scheme that you showed seems to be, uh, well, okay. Like all of them seem to have the same flavor so to say in a in a like in this in implementation i mean so you were always am i yeah i guess so so you uh okay let me because maybe this i i didn't fully understand so in the implementation parts you were kind of describing a single step of the protocol namely the partition like at mm -hmm. some point you are partitioning like you're out you're you maybe disregarded some possibilities and then you are uh, you want yeah. to have some dichotomic uh, you want yeah. to have some dichotomic mm -hmm. choice in the middle okay so but then can you okay so i understand so you can kind of one strategy would be just to fish one effect at the time in this mm -hmm. game and you will have this like li linear structure but you can also do kind of more like a tree like st yeah, structure and exactly. also you could, in principle, do this tree like stuff with an ambiguous discrimination and then or or not. I, I, I would guess so. Uh, I'm, 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 like just yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure you could. I'm just thinking of uh, how would it look like? Of course, in this simple setting of uh, one qubit and two, two output states, this doesn't make sense because yeah. all these are all the options you have. You don't have anything else. You, uh, but if you have more outcomes, um, you, you could in principle look whether it is outcome one, uh, it, if, it, if you were presented state one through three, one psi one, psi two or psi three, and or it was an inconclusive answer. And the second option would be state psi four, psi five. Yeah, yeah. You, you could do that. That's, that's the possibility, which is, not available here, you can just rearrange in this setting this, mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. effect. Because you've got just three effects, so that's all the partitioning you can do. Maybe something will come up clearer in the last slide that you have. Okay. Okay, here just the important thing is that, or the thing to notice is that if you if you are presented state psi one, I, I'm not presenting the computations, this is what the computations gave us. You are given. You are given state psi one, and then if it's an inconclusive, um, uh, if it's the uh, the answer, if you will get zero here, which means, uh, yeah, which which means that you haven't measured uh, this outcome one. Okay, what it means is that uh, you, even though you were given state psi one you are going into this, this direction, into this, this arm of the measurement, the three. This can happen because you, you want to have also the, this measurement B is both for uh, optimized for uh, having both input states. So even if you have state psi one on the input, it doesn't always end up here. Sometimes you can end up in this arm, but in this case, you will always measure this, uh, outcome question mark is, is here. Why is it? It's because if, it, if you are presented state psi one and you measure that it, it 
wasn't a state psi one, you cannot measure it uh, as a state psi two. Okay, so this has to be have post probability zero, and this is analytically provable that this this is orthogonal to uh, the effect here. Now, if uh, you measured one, then you end up here, and, uh, identify the state as psi one, and this is with prob prob probability uh, of uh, this p uh, asterisk. Um, no, it's whatever. Uh, so it's for conclusive answer. So everything holds the the, the result uh, come up very uh, come up very nicely. And now, if you present state psi two, it the computation is simpler, and you will find out that the state before the measurement is like this: is one tensor zero. This is because this U B that was uh, when we rotate to the Z basis is that if it's state psi two, it's rotated into state one. And additionally, this V one that was one of the uh, controlled operation is identity, so nothing changes to this. And so you'll always measure uh, yeah, this one prime, that it's not the state of psi one. And then it is just relatively easy to show, uh, not nice to show, but easy to show that indeed, when you come here, that with probability of conclusive answer, you will uh, get the answer to, and within conclusive answer, you will get this inconclusive uh, outcome. So everything works nice, and uh, you have these two options. So this was to show that you can start with the measurement, uh, whether it is state one or not. This might be for different reasons. For example, state one is more important for you, or, uh, well, we haven't checked that, that uh, if, if the setup would be different uh, for different pro uh, probabilities, what would change. This, this might be some for, for some future research, whether if state psi one is given with a higher probability, then this measurement might be uh, better than the previous one. Where but wait, I'm a bit, I'm a bit confused about yeah. this last thing that you said, because the way I understand your scheme, just you can view it as like an algorithm. Mm -hmm. so, you know, you have some target, target P of VM that you want to mm -hmm. implement. So if it's a P of VM, which is realized in an ambiguous state discrimination, ultimately mm -hmm. it will have all the desired features that you want. And then kind of like assuming the construction works, like it has mm -hmm. kind of all those properties, they have to be kind of satisfied because mm -hmm. otherwise the measurement wouldn't be describing the ambiguous state discrimination scheme, right? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So yeah, it, it it had to work like this, but it's it also um, the the results uh, we have, and I don't write don't pr provide here. Also have these implementation details like sure. what are these v zero, what are these v one, and uh, that it really works. What are, what are the changed uh, changed effects here? It's A actually prime. a bit funny because you could like if you forget about this uh, an ambiguous state discrimination context, you can take this. You know, you can have like a task to a student or like a puzzle, like, is it possible to, to engineer a measurement that will be doing, you know, this? And it's kind of, uh, you know, maybe, maybe uh -huh. it can be useful for something. I don't know, like, because it's, uh, it's a bit intricate, like those are a bit intricate properties. I don't know. Uh -huh. Yeah, as I said at the beginning, we started uh, to look at this problem uh, when we uh, wanted to teach students, uh, we had uh, a bachelor student that uh, was doing this unambiguous discrimination, but we also wanted to have something more general. So how to perform the POEM, these are the questions. Sure, sure. Okay, so this last slide I was talking about is here, that also uh, what happens also in, uh, in higher dimension is that I showed you this V, what it looks like, that it has this controlled operation V, uh, zero to the R minus one should be here, sorry. And then this identity. And now if you have this standard unambiguous discrimination with uh, equal probabilities, then the, uh, if, if you take this conclusive outcome effects, so AJ, 
they are always a multiple of some projection. Whatever this projection is, this is somehow orthogonal to all the other states, uh, which you can always choose, but it is uh, nevertheless a projection. So it's a multiple of projection. So V has only a single state, is, uh, is on, has only a single, is V0. It has everything else is identity. So we have uh, control, this is controlled on one state. So let's say control controlled on zero, and you perform here V0 as measure. But if you would start with the inconclusive answer, that, okay, I want to have the, the inconclusive answer here, then what happens is that uh, this, uh, this uh, outcome effect has rank of D minus one. So in fact, D minus one, where this, uh, you have D of these, D, D minus one of these would be uh, non-identity, would be non-trivial. Mm -hmm. so, so we would have to have somehow controlled on zero, controlled on one, controlled on D minus one, uh, D minus two. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is much more complex uh, uh, real, realization than the previous one uh, in here. When you look at some conclusive outcome. I, I, we haven't looked at uh, whether this can be somehow optimized, but just taking, uh, just looking at the number of these Bs, you have the, the, the very straightforward implementation would be to have as many controls as you have this non uh, uh, non-trivial means. So do I understand well that what, what you are saying is that it's best to kind of push the inconclusive outcome to the very end in this scheme? Like, so like you, because then which each, with each step, you'll be kind of doing a, just a rank one, mm -hmm. uh, like one yeah. of the effects would be rank one and therefore just a single, like a uh, single, I mean, it, it sounds to be more feasible for implementation because just a single, like single uh, control would be needed, right? Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Of course, this is just a very narrow view that we have here because we look at, okay, what happens in, in one such measurement? If you want, want to decide uh, for different outcomes, the, the one is the, uh, Smaller rank is the more favor favorable in this. Uh, in this right, but right, right. But like, if you have this, if I understood well, like, if you have this unambiguous yeah. state discrimination stuff, uh, and you kind of you are fishing, in each time you are fishing just a single effect, mm -hmm. just rank one. So then, what would happen? Okay, your in the first uh, step you will take rank one. Uh, yeah. Then in the second you will update somehow the rest. Of those POVMs via uh, the uh, procedure, yeah, via the procedure, and then you'll be still from what is left. You'll be fishing rank one guy, as far as I yes. understand. Yes. So, if if you would continue in this way, they always would be rank one. Yes, uh, because even when you smash them with, uh, yeah. on the both sides with B, they they will remain the rank one. So in this way, you can. Uh, like slice the, the outcomes one by one. Yeah. Then there is, all, of course, the question, which is better to have something more complicated, do it in, on one, in one step, yeah. and then do this orthogonalization here and measure uh, everything. Okay, it's tricky. Okay. Or okay. do it step yeah. by step. So this is not a complete, uh, like, right, I see. To because say like, that okay, this, this point I missed. So if, if you had, what you are saying is like, if you had this, uh, this complicated stuff to begin with, then this is all you have to do because then the, the, sta the post measurement states are orthogonal. Yeah. And, oh, I see. And, and oh, then tricky. And you would have to okay. measure, okay, this is just for unambiguous discrimination, but uh, maybe for some other measurement tasks or some other POVMs, you might have, uh, it might be, good to choose that, okay, I don't want to measure uh, this outcome first, but I want to measure right. this group of outcomes. Right. Okay. So it, it just opens a door for optimization. Yeah. It doesn't optimize anything. Here. It just opens the door. Okay. So, and, and this is what I was uh, wanted to tell you. So we have presented a completely new framework for splitting 
your, your your measurements into a sequence of simple measurements, uh, which provides a way of trading qubit resources for time resources. And in general, uh, as noticed, this uh, requires some condition on previous outcomes. And I, I also showed uh, the application of ambiguous state discrimination states where we obtained also a new way of looking at the uh, ambiguous discrimination task, uh, which showed the possibility of different complexities for, for different choices. So the question is what might be next? It might be nice to have a protocol that does not only decrease spatial demands, but at the same time also time demands. And I'm sure nobody has done that, right? So uh, next time I will be happy to hear from you about your result on this. Okay, finally, the references. So, uh, as I said, this all started probably with uh, Eric Anderson and Daniel Hoy. Uh, they also devised some uh, ancillary driven universal quantum computation. Uh, so, you can basically say that you can perform any channel uh, by, by, this, uh, by using just one, one uh, ancillary qubit and some measurements on it. And the, the similar result was obtained also in this paper by Chao Shen. Uh, funny enough, they, they cite the, 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 the paper one, but don't cite the paper two, which is uh, basically the same thing. And then there are your papers. Uh, this is like if framework for different realizations of measurements. Uh, to the implementation in, uh, in this direction, you can see that it was uh, people tried to do it on implement it more specifically on uh, atoms, solid state qubits, or uh, optical qubits or superconducting qubits. So this this is more uh, we have done it in more general way than. This, this was like very practical done. And just to know, there is another paper, paper on discrimination states, but this is the minimum error. And different way, different other applications are in the previous discussion papers. And by this, I conclude. Thank you for listening to me so long, for so long. No, no. Many, many thanks, Daniel, for a, Thank for, you. for a nice talk. There were multiple questions throughout the presentation, so don't, don't worry. Yeah. Like we keep this relaxed atmosphere, and like uh, yeah. So it's, I, I felt better. relaxed all the time. I had my tea. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, we have time for questions, comments to, to Daniel. Right. So uh, I have like a. Mm -hmm. a, a kind of obvious question. So, like, what are, uh, have you thought a little bit about like effects of noise, <laughs> uh, of course, on those schemes, right? Because, well, I mean, unfortunately, we know that at least uh, some of those quantum devices uh, are pretty mm -hmm. noisy right now, right? Yeah. We and this, uh, like, depending on the scheme you use, it can, like, uh, for example, if you do sequential, then it can just propagate, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. You... So, uh, three things. The, the first is, is the answer. No, we haven't thought about it. <laughs> Actually, can I be correct? The, the second we thing is that... We have thought about this separately. We have thought about effects, and we have thought about noise. <laughs> but not together. <laughs> <laughs> I see. So yeah, um, as as I stated at the beginning, we all, we assumed the the sigma z measurements. We have yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And that, that's all we did. We didn't go in this direction any further, whether if they are not noisy, and so on. And uh, I think here in this paper might be. No, no, no. Where. Uh, no, this is uh, the one with Zoltan that you had that uh, you con considered these uh, noisy measurements, right? Ah, yes, sure, sure, yes. Uh, so maybe so that could is... be used on this, right? like independently. Uh -huh, so it's uh, okay. So in those types of tasks, I think it's uh, not uh, not possible to do this because what we do uh, is we correct the the probability distributions. So 
we as of now at least using those methods and there is like uh, okay so yeah. i i don't think there are on the uh, now on the market i don't think there are ma methods which correct for single outcomes mm -hmm. of, of course yeah which would be needed uh, here in in unambiguous mm -hmm. discrimination task yes this wouldn't be <laughs> you 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 need to be sure that it's it's state psi one if you get the outcome one yeah Exactly. But, exactly. But as a general yes. scheme, this could be used together with a with a correction. Like, uh, sure. Yeah. If you are yeah. interested in estimating some like uh, mm -hmm. you know expected values of something yeah. or like just weighted distributions, then yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, right. I okay. guess maybe just yeah. just just a comment because like when we were playing, when when we when we had this work with Zoltan and also some follow up works, we just focus on. P of VMs, not on instruments so far. Ah, yes, yeah. yes. That's the reason, all. I mean, one that's of the true. reasons, of mm -hmm. course, like P of VMs are simpler, but also uh, on the hardware side, instruments were not typically available uh, until, I mean, okay, on Rigetti, they were maybe available, I would say, uh, but they were very bad. Just, re I think, just mm -hmm. recently, IBM uh, in put. Uh, using the language that we understand put instruments like put mm -hmm. like uh, measurements uh, that you can put in the circuit and then do something with the rest of this yes 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 so they implemented it already so they recently they updated it to allow for conditional operations okay uh, yes I, I we didn't use it yet like there mm -hmm. was just some note that we saw uh, i don't know maybe mm -hmm. uh, if oscar is here maybe he already used it so this is like our colleague, but I don't know if he's here. <laughs> no, uh, he's uh, uh, yes. here. No, he is. Yes, uh, I am. Here. Right. So, so do, did you uh, use this uh, conditional operations on IBM already? Does it work? <laughs> uh, I use conditional. Uh, yes, yes, I use, and they work. Okay, so okay. we have first hand. But how well do they work, Oscar? Uh, <laughs> sorry. How well? So you use it for some demonstrations of uh, interpretation, I believe, or something like that. Or I mean, um, I'm not sure how they work on the hardware. In fact, so ah, so you only use the so, uh, so you use the simulations. Only. Yes, because I only used it uh, on uh, during a tutoring. So, ah, okay. I didn't it's check how so, they work on. A... So, uh, well, I mean, one can suspect that on hardware it might be problematic. Yeah, but but uh, on uh, in simulation it worked all uh, even before that. So, <laughs> I, I never had. You know, we can I, I never had problem in simulator with conditional measurements. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you run the the program on uh, simulation and it runs nicely. So let's say teleportation without problems. Then you run it on a, on the on a IBM computer, it gives an error, or at, at least before it gives certainly an error. Just right. So I mean, so uh, well, I think we read that you can already do it on uh -huh. hardware, but yeah. it, well, I mean, of course, one can just check it. I don't. Uh, I didn't use it so yeah. far. So what we tried uh, afterwards was uh, to condition on the on on some some qubit state. Which would be, mm -hmm. let's say, uh, in, in in a cl classical state, mm -hmm. but that was very terrible. <laughs> the <laughs> results were completely random. And I sure. don't know why. Why? So okay. I'll be happy to, to. I'm happy to hear that they implemented the, the, the condition. So I think, like for what I remember, the you know those operations are typically much more de demanding than just destructive measurement and hence the fide like fidelities are and you have to deal i think the fidelities were, were much worse mm -hmm. i think this is some so i know like uh, yeah i think it's some like also on the performance side i i, I would doubt if people kind of checked this like how it really works because like you know people from computer science they they don't think about instruments that much you know, and it, like, uh, how to put it? Uh, yeah, it's a, uh, but, you know, but, but still like, for example, I think that your scheme or like some modifications of it would be, it would be a very nice benchmark, benchmark for those devices, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Like to kind of, to run it, like some, or some simple version of it. And then 
to kind of do, I know, some tomographic experiments and stuff. Mm -hmm. Because, okay, I, I guess ultimately those uh, sequential measurements, they are for, for the vendors, they are important because like for error, ultimately people would like to do error correction. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then you need to do some stuff in an adaptive manner, right? And mm -hmm. <laughs> otherwise you are sure. kind of stuck. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, it's a bit, no, I, okay. I, yeah, I, I like the, uh, your, your, your scheme, like, okay. What is, what, what I think is still like very challenging is to, to have some handle on really complexity of those measurements. Cause I, uh, like, I, <laughs> I mean, also using like both, both in the paper, like, both in your construction and also in those works that you cite, I guess for multi-qubit system, like it's really not, it's hard to understand what, like how, comp, like how to, I don't know, like imagine for example, that you have like a, a bunch of states that mm -hmm. uh, pure states that you want to discriminate, discriminate in an ambiguous manner, but you know that you, you can prefer those states with relatively simple circuits, like, Question is, uh, like each of those states individually, can you have a simple, like a simple quantum circuit that would do the uh, the unambiguous state discrimination, or uh, mm -hmm. like, does it go crazy? Like I, I expect it won't, mm -hmm. but like uh, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. So there's this possibility that at some point it will blow up, but uh, like. This was the is the this is the the, the, the thing to look at during this uh, implementation. Yeah. That, that's all we had here. Yeah. So we haven't so looked I at guess, other parts. I, yeah. Uh, so so I guess you have this this proposal like that where you, where you will be kind of aiming partially to to do something with it, right? Uh, uh, we would like to try it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Would be would be cool. Uh, Especially yeah. now that you told that uh, it is possible to have uh, this conditional measurements on IBM. I think they even put it on their blog, you know, so they were kind of bragging mm -hmm. about it. But yes, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, yes. So. Good. Well, someone should test it, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I will go and test it. <laughs> yeah. Pardon? And then I will go and test it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, cool. Okay. Uh, so, are there any uh, any further comments to Daniel and Jan? Uh, okay. If not, let us maybe uh, let us finish and thank uh, thank Daniel again for a very nice and didactic presentation. I think it was very clear and easy to follow, also for students. Uh, and uh, yes, let's let's hope we'll see each other. I know, like sooner than later in person. Uh, yeah. You know, when this pandemic is is over finally. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Thank you for inviting me. And uh, yeah, let's hope to see soon. See, see yeah. each other soon. <laughs>